Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. My name is Mike, and I'm one of the teachers uh, here on the teaching team. And um, we are um, here to affirm that your emergency broadcast system works loud and clear. Um, so well done, Nashville. My goodness, this city has been through a lot. We are going to take some time today to talk a bit about Palm Sunday. It's usually a day where we have our kids march around with palm branches, and it seems like a, a joyful sort of celebration. But as that text was hinting at that David read, it's a really somber thing for Jesus. And so we just want to, um, if you've not been with us for a while, I'm a bit of a, a geek. And so we're going to do about 15 minutes of painful background, and then we'll get to the story again. Um, so uh, we're in Luke 19. And uh, there are three, I get my, my, one of the best parts of my life is I, I get uh, to be professionally curious. So anytime I, I go to a Bible passage, I'm just always asking, well, where was this and why was that important? Why palm branches? What was the significance of those? Why that day? Was there a big deal about that day? I'm just always, you know, I just get to, I get to ask all of these big questions. And as it turns out, there are three huge things happening on that Palm Sunday. It wasn't obviously called Palm Sunday back then. But three enormous things. One religious, one political, and one prophetic. All right, so 10 minutes on those, and then we'll start kind of plugging away as, why, as to why that matters. All right? The religious thing that was happening is that that day was the beginning of preparations for Passover. Right, so it was the 10th day of the first month, and in accordance with Exodus chapter 12, go ahead and throw that on there if you would. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. So this was... The day that Jesus enters Jerusalem is, is Lamb Selection Sunday. We have our NCAA Selection Sunday. This was Passover Selection Sunday. And the idea is um, every, so there were about 200,000 people that would descend upon Jerusalem, far exceeding its capacity. So people would live all or, or stay all around uh, the city. And you would have to go in, on, the, on this day, on this Sunday, the lambs would be chosen by by each family, to be the lamb that would be examined for four days, and then if it was without defect, would be sacrificed for the Passover sacrifice. So there's a great deal of imagery that Jesus, who is called the Passover lamb, comes into the city on the day the lambs are chosen for sacrifice. And, and the way the Gospels tell it, he's examined for four days in the temple courts before he offers himself as a sacrifice. I mean, there's a great deal of parallelism there. But for our purposes, Passover, what was Passover the celebration of? Do you remember in Exodus? What were we celebrating when we celebrated Passover? Yes, but what, did, but, but what was accomplished in that? I mean, you're absolutely right. Points for enthusiastic and loud. But what happened as a result of that? What? Freedom from slavery. There was a political enemy, and they were delivered from that oppressive rule. Correct? So Passover wasn't a religious holiday in the sense of celebrating, hey, we go to heaven someday. Passover was, hey, remember when we were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered us with his mighty hand. Right? Now, Fast forward to this time period, Israel is under the rule of the Romans. It is an oppressive rule indeed. Passover was the season when would-be messiahs would make their claim, and would-be revolutionaries would make their claim to be leading Israel and to deliver Israel. Passover was revolution season. It was revolt season. It was messiah season. In the same way that Moses delivered Israel from Egypt, a new Moses will come and deliver Israel from Rome, all right? That's the religious thing happening. Because Passover was revolt season, there's a political thing happening. 
stationed in the temple complex are Roman soldiers in the Antonia Fortress, in case you care. And that, um, that fortress was reinforced on this specific day by a procession led by Pilate. So the rulers of Judea would not stay in Jerusalem. They would stay near the, near the sea, and they would march down in triumphal procession to the city and arrive in the front gate, the west gate. And they would be accompanied by troops in full armor and gear. It looks like this. Someone Instagrammed it this morning. Um, so it probably joke uh, that did not work at all. But um, it may have looked a little bit something like that. And remember, as we, if you've been with us, right, we've seen all these parallels between the, 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 the way that Rome proclaimed its divinity and the way Jesus kind of subverts that. So this was an imperial display of power and might and divinity. This was Rome is in charge. We will not tolerate rebellion. Okay? A huge deal. Caesar, not Caesar, but shoot, Pilate coming in, representing Caesar, on the other side of the city. All right, makes sense so far. So that's the political thing that's happening. And revolt, I mean, revolt was in the air with, um, right before Jesus was born. Uh, there was a revolt uh, when Herod uh, died, 4 BC. Um, and the city of Sepphoris was destroyed, the city of Emmaus was destroyed, and 2,000 Jews were crucified along one large stretch heading into Jerusalem. So this was a real political thing. It's like if ISIS kind of oversaw America, and then on the 4th of July, we get a little itchy. You know what I mean? That's the kind of, there's this political sort of spark sitting under there. So you have a religious thing happening, Passover season. You have a political thing happening, Pilate coming in from the West in great procession. And then you have a prophetic thing happening. Here comes this Nazarene fellow coming in from the opposite gate, the back gate, the east gate. And he's coming in riding a colt instead of a stallion, which Pilate would have had. And he's not accompanied by soldiers. He's accompanied by ch children and women and peasants. Might, maybe it looks something like this. This was Instagrammed yesterday. <laughs> Ellen, bless you, I know. I was, it's going to sit there until it got a forced laugh. <laughs> And so, so, and the streets, of course, were, were that narrow, and it was that tight of spaces. And so, so you have this incredible picture of three things happening, right? When, when, because it's Passover and we're choosing the lambs, big religious, Jerusalem is swelling, but it's also revolt season. It's revolution season. So Rome makes sure there are extra troops. At the head of that is Pilate, and they come in. And remember, the whole boast of Rome was that they brought peace and salvation to the earth. So they were coming, bringing peace into this hotbed of political activity. And exactly opposite that, Jesus of Nazareth arranges, this was pre-thought out, right? The whole thing about go find a, a donkey and a foal and use the password, the Lord needs it, right? I mean, he had purposefully arranged a counter-demonstration on the other side of the city. Are you with me so far? So these are three bombs that are going off in the middle of Jerusalem that day. And Jesus is coming in, of course, in fulfillment of Zechariah. Go ahead and put that up, David, if you would. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your what? Your king. Jesus is coming as king. He comes to you righteous and victorious. Now, those are great Roman words. But then also lowly and riding on a donkey. Those are not Roman words, right? See, the contrast couldn't be greater. He's royal and he's victorious, but he doesn't look anything like royal and victorious. He's riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Next. Then Yahweh says, this king will take away the chariots from Israel. This is another name for Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. In other words, this king is coming to take all the implements of war away. And the, the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim what? Peace. So he comes in in fulfillment 
dude, the Nazarene guy that just raised somebody from the dead down the road is coming in doing the Zechariah thing as king. So, so can you understand why? In the middle of Passover, in a counter-procession to Pilate, here comes Jesus on a colt as king. Can you understand why all of a sudden the city just gets thrown into turmoil? And you can also see why the people begin to respond, right? This isn't like just this token little thing like, oh, hey, Jesus. No, no, no. This was a huge deal. So the people respond, uh, and they begin doing things like they brought cloaks and laid them down on the road. Uh, they began to shout joyfully, blessed is the king. The king! If you're Roman, are those kind of the words you're looking out for? Yeah. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They shout, other gospels tell us, they shout, Hoshana, Hosanna, if you're a Toto fan. Hoshana, again, bad joke, Timothy, that's for you. Um, Hoshana, which means save us now. So they're, they're doing the palm branches, and they're laying cloaks down, and they're shouting, and they're singing, and it's awesome, right? And you're like, yes, this is it, Jesus, finally. Now he's unveiling himself for all to see, yes. But then you realize that there's a reason why they're saying the things they're saying, and they're doing the palm branch thing. That's just not random. It's not like they just had palms and were like, dude, let's lay down some palm branches. This would be cool. This has a massive backstory, all right? Five more minutes, okay? Backstory so matters. Kids, you're doing great. You're doing great. Parents, you're doing great too. All right, now, in between Malachi and Matthew, the end of the Old Testament, the beginning of the New, there's 400 years of history, okay? During those 400 years, a guy named Alexander the Great shows up, conquers pretty much the known world. Alexander has one goal, and that goal is to Hellenize the world, to turn the world Greek. And we could spend hours talking about that project and how ingenious he was, not only at conquering people, but then wooing them into the Greek worldview. Israel was a part of that initial land grab. And there was a big struggle within the nation of Israel as more and more Jewish young men became Hellenized instead of staying faithful to Torah. Alexander died. His kingdom was split. The area that oversaw Judea, that whole area, was the Seleucid Empire. And there came a ruler in about 170 B.C. or B.C.E., whichever you prefer. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And this guy is about as evil as you can get. First of all, he casts out the high priests. Now, the high priests, according to Yahweh were to be descendants of Aaron. He just installs political puppets in the high priesthood. He begins to use the, the, high, the temple, the temple, the temple, to worship the god Apollo. He slaughters pigs in the Holy of Holies. He outlaws Torah. He outlaws circumcision. Okay, I mean, it was... Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Daniel prophesies about him. He calls him an abomination. When you see the abomination of desolation, that's the guy. The Jews revolt, led by a man named Judas Maccabee. The Hammer was his nickname, which is awesome. Judas Maccabee and his family, they, be, they ferment a revolt that spreads like wildfire through Israel, and they finally, they finally kick out the pagans. They retake Jerusalem, and they do it right at the beginning of winter. They recapture the temple, and they dedicate the temple. Now, there's a, there's a feast, a festival called Sukkot that they are to celebrate in the fall. It's the ingathering festival. It celebrates harvest. What you do at Sukkot is you wave palm branches because it sounds like rain. They couldn't celebrate Sukkot that year because they were at war. So when they reclaimed the temple... They did an eight-day celebration. It was just the famous late Sukkot. And they rededicated the temple. And this is the very famous miracle. They had a little bit of oil, and it lasted eight days, what we call Hanukkah. Okay? Now, here's the important part for us. 
because of Sukkot and the time and all of that, the palm branch became the symbol of the revolution. And the shout Hoshana became the, the shout of save us from the Greeks. Okay? In fact, this is how geeky I am. Let's show the coins. What do you see on those? These are, these are coins minted during the Hasmonean dynasty. This is the, these are the members of the uh, Maccabean family. In their politi- the, it, Rome or Israel was independent for about 100 years before Pompey conquered them again. But what, what do you see there? Palm tree. Why palm tree? Was it because, hey, they look great on a coin? No, the palm tree symbolized the rededication of the temple. Next. Palm trees. Ooh, I wonder what this next one will be. Palm trees. Right? Now, these are all from that time frame. So, here comes Jesus. It's Passover. Political zealot season. Pilate coming in from one end. And Jesus purposely counter-processing in fulfillment to the kingly prophecy of Zechariah. So what do they do in response? They grab palm branches and they sing Hoshana, save us now. And what are they saying to Jesus at that moment? What are they saying to him? What are they asking of him? To bring about revolt, right? Just the way the Maccabees did. Now this is so important because of what happens next. So I've never understood this next bit. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And another gospel says, shut them up. Why? Well, palm branches were outlawed by Rome because of their political ramifications. So they're shouting, here's our king, save us now, waving palm branches on Passover. Not on the day, but uh, the preparation. So what are the Pharisees saying? Jesus, you're going to get us all killed. Jesus says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, we, we typically think that this response means, well, these people are praising me, and if you shut them up, then the rocks are going to praise me. And I always thought that, but that's not what it's saying. The, the stones will cry out is a quotation from Habakkuk 2, which, as we all are very familiar with, Habakkuk 2. Habakkuk 2 is a prophetic oracle against Jerusalem from Yahweh. And in that oracle, Yahweh critiques Israel by saying it's a city that has been built on blood and injustice. And that the rocks will cry out against them because of the blood they have shed. Oh. Okay. And, and, and if you're not convinced that's what he's saying, notice his next response. As he approached the city and saw it, what did he do? He wept. Why? If you, Jerusalem, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you what? Peace! But now it is hidden from your eyes. And then he talks about what will happen in literally 40 years, 36 years from this date probably, when Jerusalem will pick a fight, an armed revolt against Rome. And in four years, the temple will be destroyed, never to be rebuilt. He says to them, the days will come when, you, when your enemies will build an embankment against you. And that actually happened. And encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave 
one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Oh, my friends, I always thought Palm Sunday was this cute little kids waving palm thing. And I never really understood why the crowd would be disappointed in him later in the week. And as best as I can guess, it's Passover season. This is the season of deliverance. Here comes Caesar doing his normal Caesar thing through his instrument pilot. But then there's this deliberate counter procession and it's kingly. So everyone knew the don riding on a donkey part and the king, but I guess everybody forgot the, well, we're gonna take your weapons of war away and bring peace. And the Pharisees are so shocked by the palm branches and the yelling and the king and Hoshana, they tell everyone to shut up. And he says, no, 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 even if they do, the rocks will cry out in judgment against you and your commitment to bloodshed. And so he weeps over the fact that he knows within 40 years, they will be so committed to fighting Rome with the ways of Rome that their city will be utterly destroyed. If you had only known what would bring you peace that day. Because what were they asking Jesus to do? How were they asking Jesus to bring peace? How? Same way Pilate does. We want this parade to look like that one, right? I mean, and I just have to say, <laughs> I felt so heavy about this. Because I sit and I think, you did not, you, Jerusalem, you who have yearned for Yahweh's return, you who have, who have memorized ah, the text, right? From your various, I mean, you recite the Psalms and you know the prophets and you know this, you've been immersed in it. Even you, if you had known, but you did not recognize the time of God's coming. Oh, this Palm Sunday was a disaster. And I can't help but wonder, 2,000 years later, which parade we prefer. I can't help but read this as an indictment of me and my Americanized Christianity that much prefers the ways of Pilate than the ways of Jesus. Even if I would have been courageous enough to be on the backside of the city welcoming Jesus, I'd have been waving palm branches, yep, get rid of the pagans, let's go. Palm Sunday confronts us. Not only <laughs> did the Romans get it wrong, but God's people did too. Because they refused to believe that the way of Jesus was actually the way of peace. We have that same re refusal thousands of years later. We don't believe that humility works. I mean, there's so much to be afraid of. How many of us think that the way to handle all of this fear is to be more generous, be more humble, forgive our enemies, pray against those who persecute us, and don't make an enemy of anyone who disagrees with you? None of us think that is the way to win. In fact, the whole notion of winning shows we've fallen into the ways of Caesar to begin with. There's no culture war. There is salt and light, and that's it. And my friends, I cannot help, for me, just me personally, just me, I can't speak to you, for me, this is such an indictment upon what I trust and lean to look to for peace. If you would have only known Jerusalem, it wasn't beating the Romans, it was forgiving them. And we all say as good Christian people, oh yeah, but none of us, none of us, maybe I'm projecting onto you, I don't believe that. When I look at how crazy the world is, I am impressed by technology, I'm impressed by wealth, I'm impressed by power, I'm impressed by influence, I'm impressed by politics. And I just can't help but think most of the American church would be over there rooting on the grand displays of power. 
And because of that, I think, I wonder how much I miss when Yahweh actually does come to me, when Jesus does come. But I'm so convinced it's in the spectacular and it's in the goosebumps and it's in the mountaintops that I just don't even think to look in the valleys and in the deserts. I think of my little boy, Seth, we talk about him. You'll get tired of me talking about him, but he's roaming around causing havoc and chaos right now in this very building. Who knows? All I know is if it's quiet, it's not good, okay? (laughs) We found out, and again, I apologize for the repetition, but this is such a great example. We found out three months before he was born they had Down syndrome. I begged God to heal him. I beg God for a normal family. I grieved, I moaned, I lamented. And I just think, and we were obviously offered the option of terminating the pregnancy. And I just think, had I, had he been healed or whatever, I would have missed what it was like to have Jesus come. 12 years into this, I mean, and I know it's the cliche thing, but it's, it's actually really true. He mentors me in the way of Jesus. And to think that in my whatever, I would have chosen to miss God's coming, you know? So I just sit, my friends on a, on a day like today in a world that is so, I mean, we have another mass shooting and everything's politicized and racial strife. And I mean, it's just, there's so much to be angry about, outraged about, divided over. There's so much. And I think, I think Jesus might just be looking for people who dare to believe that the small, slow, enemy-loving, self-sacrificial way of Jesus the King is how peace actually comes to the earth. And if that's true, I just, I want to be one of those people that say yes to that, you know? I don't, I don't want to miss it because I've just seen so much of his great work is done in these hard, hard times. And so much of my Christianity is designed to keep me from them. So we're going to take the bread and the cup together. If you're online, take this time to raid pantry. And I I think maybe I'm going to take however you want to, but I'm going to take the bread and the cup today differently. I'm going to take it saying, God, I receive you however you come. I want to repent of all the preconceived, Americanized, individualized, consumeristic, Western ways of demanding your arrival. And I just, I want to become the kind of person that sees you in the places that are very surprising. And so I'm going to take the bread and the cup today because that's, I, I want to be part of that revolution, you know. And maybe if you're a journaler, take a piece of the paper just reflect on how it is that he actually comes. I mean, certainly the biblical witness isn't that he comes expectantly (laughs) or that he always comes shouting from the rooftops. If there's one thing the Bible is super clear on about God, he is never predictable. He is always reliable. He is never predictable. So how can we figure out, figure that we've got it nailed? So maybe this is just a time of repentance a bit for us. At least it will be for me. Let me pray. We'll take the bread and the cup together. Lord Jesus, I really do struggle to believe that your way works in the world. I know it works in individual relationships. I've seen that. But just to be committed to that enemy love, the blessing of the persecutors, the humble servant heartedness, the not claiming and boasting and fighting for rights. Lord, that is so foreign to us. 
And so we just need to be reminded. We need, almost need to be wept over as people who if we'd known what would bring us peace, we would have seen and recognized you long before this. So the cliche, God, of course, give us eyes to see, but more than that, Lord, form us into people who begin to trust the small and the insignificant and the humble, that boast in weakness and generosity and forgiveness. Help us to believe, God, really, that the way peace comes is the way Jesus brought it. And so, God, would you breathe over us courage in this crazy, crazy time. We love you. We love you. And I, I speak for a lot of us when we just say, come, come among us, Lord Jesus. Form us into those kind of people.